Welcome to our April Soul Fund presentation. We are Quality Sewing and Vacuum, and we have 11 stores in the Pacific Northwest. I'm Lana Jones. And I'm Linda James. And if you would comment, share, or post a picture of your show and tell um, in the uh, comment section of this uh, Facebook page, um, entry into our, uh, you'll get an entry into two drawings for our uh, door prizes. These will be drawn on Monday, May 2nd. Our discount prices are good until Sunday, May 8th, Orders over $100 shipping will um, be uh, free. Orders over $100 ship free within the continental USA. There, I got it. Um, orders to be picked up at any of our store locations will have no shipping. Okay? I'm going to start off our presentation with our Melville vest. Um, the pattern comes in sizes double small to double large. It's a cardigan and a vest. And I made the vest, I don't know if you can see it from there because it's quarter, three quarter length. I made the vest so that it's reversible. And the way I did that, I eliminated my facings on the pattern and made a front and back of my printed fabric. I call it my horse blanket. And the same with the black wool. I then proceeded to make the darts in the printed fabric and the black wool, and then I put them back to back, basted the, the, uh, both units together all the way around, and then I cut the arm's eye a little bit deeper because I knew I was going to wear a vest, it would make it into a vest, and I would not have need for those seam allowances. And then I used a product called Peter Sham. It's wool Peter Sham binding. And I went around the entire uh, garment with that binding, including the arm's eye. I purchased the Peter Sham binding from a company online uh, by the name of Latoff. They also have Peter Sham in a rayon and that's what I'm going to demonstrate application of. So we'll go do that. So the binding I've taken two pieces of fabric and put them back to back so that it's the same application as my vest. Here's the binding. I already started it off and mitered the corner as you would with a quilt. So the binding has kind of a um, groove down the middle where you bend it in half, place it along the edge of your fabric, and then So, let's see here, I guess I'll, come on, right down the edge. And if you're using um, a matching thread, I think this is pale blue, matching thread, that, then that would, would not show. And there you have it and it's stitched nicely on both sides. And that finishes off my vest. So you might, might wanna see this. And then I'll take off and show you the reverse side. So there you have it, the Melville vest, two for the time of one. All right, now Lana's going to do the bucket. We're pattern. going to talk about the bucket pattern now. And this was a, such a fun pattern to do. I believe that a confident beginner could easily do this pattern. And um, on my bucket, 
Um, I have some stash fabric that I use because I just love these. I bought a bunch of it when um, one of the stores was clearing out, and you'll see this a number of times in my samples because I bought a lot of it. Um, it is adorable. And um, what I did was I did it a little bit different than the pattern because I'm thinking if you made this for someone like my grandson, you'd want to add a little bit of extra oomph to it um, so that it would last through um, trucks and toys and uh, su suckers and whatever else could be thrown in here, okay? So I did double the lining, and instead of one layer, I put two layers of lining. And then um, in the pockets, I doubled the pocket um, as well, so that there's two layers um, of fabric in the, in the pockets. And the, um, the uh, pockets, when I sewed them down, the pockets are in the top and in the bottom. When I sewed them down, I sewed them all the way through the, the lining, so there, there was lots of, um, make it lot, uh, much more sturdy. I also took um, this stuff called Premier Clear Vinyl, and we are going to use this several times throughout the presentation today. And what I did was I put this in the bottom of the bucket. Uh, so just in case a sucker did go in there, it could be easily cleaned, and obviously you could put that vinyl in the entire inside to make it easy to clean, but I chose just the bottom of it. And um, because everything is pink in here, I decided on a pink bucket to go with it. So I really liked how this turned out. Super easy to make and it didn't take very long at all. And this is my bucket pattern. I made mine in a sewing themed fabric. Did self uh, fabric ties on the side. I've got the blue bucket from one of the local box stores. And the pattern called for a bow at the top of the handle. And I tried my best and I could not get it through. So I simply finished the bow, whip stitched it around the, the handle on the bale and put a little cute little ribbon on here with a button for accent. Mine is just self fabric lined. And it's got the pockets to put all your little gadgets. I've got coordinating colored sewing things inside my bucket. So that's, that's our bucket tote. The next item that we're going to show you is the Tango Tote. It's our bag for the month. I did mine <clears throat> with a kind of um, straw-looking home deck fabric and this one I got at one of the other stores. It's also a canvas. It has a pocket in the front, a zipper on the top, and I've got my vest stuffed in there to keep it plumped out. It's got a couple pockets inside, one with a zipper, and I put a little key lanyard inside of it just so I can keep my keys up handy where I can get them. And Lana will show you hers. Okay, um, I made mine um, uh, out of just cotton. I didn't use any home deck fabric. I did use soft and stable as my stabilizer inside. The only change I made to this was I did put in a double zipper in mine, a two-way zipper instead of a single zipper. And I honestly do like a black lining in my purses because it just doesn't show the, uh, the dirt, but you can't see anything. So what I did was I did black and pink. So my pockets are black, my inside um, lining is pink, and I do have the zipper pocket in here as well. And with any purse that you make, you could put in as many pockets as you want, and the outside pocket as well on the, um, the tangle tote. So this was a really fun, uh, First to make, and I love the size of it. Lots of room in here to put um, everything that you need. The next pattern that we're going to be talking about um, is the uh, pineapple, uh, pineapple surprise. And we have a ruler that goes with that. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can either buy the pattern so that you can make this exact one, which uh, uh, Linda will show you hers. She, Linda follows directions well. That will give you a hint that I don't. Okay, so um, uh, this is such a cute pattern, um, and she'll show you uh, about that one. Uh, so you can make this one, or you can use the ruler, and um, use the ruler with the um, pineapple surprise, or use the ruler without the pineapple surprise and make your own design. Well, I decided that I was going to make my own design. Okay, so up here, 
is my pineapple design. Now, I never liked doing pineapples before because mine never turned out square. And um, Linda said, when we, when we pick out our um, samples and, and our, our products and stuff, she said she wanted to do the pineapple. And I said, I don't because I never got one square. And she goes, no, I want to do the pineapple, and there's a ruler that goes with it. I want that too. And I went, oh, there's a ruler? Well, maybe I changed my mind now, because I know with a ruler, you're going to have a lot better chance of making a square pineapple, OK? So uh, Linda will show you how to use that in just a minute. But um, I decided to not follow the rules and make the pattern. I decided to do my own thing. Well, um, in the process of going out to get all my, my fabrics and stuff out of my stash, I found this little stash of off-white fabric. I have no idea where it came from. It was a stack of fat eighths, and I went, oh my gosh, I might need that for something. So I just grabbed that, because you know if you need it later, you'll never find it in your stash. So I set that on my table, and I went on about my business. And then I decided that I was um, going to start the pineapple quilt, and I went, oh, those um, fat eighths will be perfect for the, um, for the pineapple quilt. And since they're only fat eighths, I'm just going to cut them all up, OK? Because there's, there's not, just not that much fabric there. So I started putting my pineapple together. And um, if you notice, uh, my pineapple doesn't have the white going all out in the same direction. It kind of changes. And I did that on purpose. I didn't, I love the pineapple, but I wanted to be different. So on the fifth row, I just kind of twisted everything around and I made the fifth row all one, all one color. And just kind of mixed it up a little bit just so it wasn't the same. Well, when I was all done putting the pineapple together, um, I had a whole bunch of these strips left over, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is so much fabric from these fat ace. I decided to do the piano keys all around the outside. That's not on the pattern, that's just my decision. Um, and so now, instead of piano keys, these are called pineapple slices. So I did pineapple slices all the way around, and then I finished it off with a couple borders um, of fabric from the from the pineapple, and then I just did a stitch in the ditch. And that turned out really well. I was really pleased with the results of that. And I still have some off-white fabric left. <laughs> it just keeps growing, I think. So it was a lot, of, um, a lot of fun to make. And honestly, if the pattern had told me to put the piano keys around the outside, I would have thought, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'll end it right here. You know? But since it was my idea, it was fabulous, and I was going to do that. Okay? So Linda will show her sample now. Okay, I'm going to take you over to the machine because I want to show you the, the ro Ulfa rotary mat that we have to cut with. And I started doing this, this um, block at home. So those are the samples that I brought. This is the first square and on the ruler it tells you right here, you cut your two inch square and you line it up like this after you, well, I'm sorry, let me back up just a little bit on this. After you cut your two inch square, or one and a half inch square, I think it is, then you put these pieces on all four sides. Line it up on your ruler like this, and then put this on the mat and you cut the corners off. And that's off all four sides. So I'm going to line that up, take my rotary ruler, or rotary knife, and cut those off. Turn that around. This is a Lazy Susan type mat. Round them up. And line that up with that square. And that gives you your first row. Then I'm going, this is an example of the second row after I sewed them on. So we'll take these 
this to the machine. And center those on the square. Use your quarter inch mark and And then if you had the iron handy, you'd press those out and then place your next two centered on there like this. And then you press that out. Now this is your second row. So following your directions, you're going to look on your ruler and it says round two. So then you center that center square up and you can cut Go ahead and slice that round off. Center round two. And you can see that you end up with your second round. And then you just follow the ruler and it goes from one round to the next. It tells you on the instructions exactly how to use this ruler. Now, what I suggest is that you, when you open it up, read the instructions and then read them again because it takes a little bit of getting used to using this ruler, but it will walk you through each round so that you can make either a six inch block or the 12 inch block. Lana's were the 12 inch. Mine had, and I'll show you on my Halloween quilt. This is the, I used Halloween fabrics. This is exactly as it is written on the pattern with two 12 inch blocks and two six inch blocks with the spacing in between. And then I quilted it with glow in the dark, a spider themed quilting. So that's our pineapple surprise. All right, the next book we're going to, or the first book actually, we're gonna talk about is Tis the Season. This is a great book um, with a lot of different um, projects in it. You can see there's quite a few, um, uh, 12 different patterns in here from quilts to table runners to ornaments to pillows and all types of um, fun projects to do. Uh, the first one I want to show you is this one. And um, uh, when I saw this pattern, it just yelled at me to digitize it. It is not digitized in the book and Linda will show you her version of that. But I decided that, oh, I just really wanted to digitize this, which for those of you who don't know what that means, I took the design, brought it into my embroidery software, and I decided where all the stitches would be so that I could embroider it on my embroidery machine. And so this is the project that I did. All the lettering was um, digitized. The, um, the applique is the snowman himself, but the bird and the hat and all that were digitized. And I could honestly get that done 
faster digitizing it and stitching it out than I could if I had to hand stitch this myself. So um, that was really a lot of fun. And then I did this one. And this was supposed to be a pillow, um, but when, as we travel around from store to store to store, pillow forms take up a lot of room. And even if you, know, you take the pillow form out so you can store this, you still have a pillow form. So I decided just to make this a wall hanging, but if you choose to make a pillow, it would be adorable as a pillow. And it has 3D flowers. And what I wanna show you um, is how I did that. And I'm gonna do it right here. Out my samples here and this I'll just lay out a piece of black fabric here so you can see it better okay so the first thing you want to do is stitch out or to stitch out how about print on your computer? Print out a picture of what you're going to, um, the leaf or whatever it happens to be. Um, and I use 65 pound cardstock on this, okay? Then you're going to want to um, cut that out. And honestly, this is a great way to do it because with cardstock, you can run your pencil around here and it's nice and firm. But as you're drawing your, line, your design onto your fabric, how far down do I have to go before I miss the first one because I can't see? So instead, I'm gonna use the clear vinyl again and I'm gonna cut out my pattern out of the clear vinyl. And now I can draw it, I can see where it is, I can go down, draw the next one, draw the next one, draw the next one, and I don't waste any fabric. Now for some of us, we've got a lot of fabric, but if we have just a little bit of what we wanna use, we wanna make sure we maximize that, okay? So on the... Um, poinsettia, there are five petals, so I will need 10 pieces, um, 10 petals, one for each side, okay? But I'm only going to draw five. I only need to draw five, okay? So here we have, and I'll just show you one. So here's one that is um, drawn, and I just use um, whatever marker is my favorite, and we'll, uh, Linda will discuss some markers in a little bit that we've brought in. And um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my rotary cutter and I'm going to slash it right there. Slash it now, instead of when you're all done and then you're trying to open it up to get your scissors in there, put a little slash in there right now so that you don't have to worry about it later, okay? Then I'm going to fold it up and uh, so right sides together and I'm going to put it the side without the drawing on the um, batting, okay? So now I'm good, so I've got my um, piece already, and now I'm going to stitch right on the line that I drew. So you can see here I've stitched right around the line, okay, the side with my slash is already on there, and then I'm going to take my Kai scissors, and I specifically use these Kai's, they're um, double bent blunt edge, I don't know if you can see that, but they're blunt edge. And the reason why I like that for this is as I'm trimming this away, the point doesn't get caught in the batting as I'm going around. So um, I use my pointed ones in embroidery and I like my blunt ones for something like this. And I trim all the way around the edge with my double curved ties. Then I'm gonna take my pinking shears and I'm going to pink all around the edge so I don't have to go clip, 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 clip. I just pink it all around the edge, okay? Then, I'm going to take Seema Steam, de, st <laughs> this stuff, Steema Seam 2 half inch, okay, just a little piece of it, and I'm going to put that in the batting, okay, and that's just going to stay there for now. Then I will turn it right side out, and I will take my handy dandy um, uh, um, precision tool. This is the R and K precision turning tool, and I like this one because it's flat on all sides and it won't run away. It'll stay right where you put it. And I'm gonna run that, after I turn it right sides out, I'm gonna run that all around the edge to kind of help to press it and push it out so I have a nice clean um, edge. Now I'm gonna go in there and I'm going to remove that piece of paper, okay? And fuse that together, okay? In the book, it says to hand sew. I don't do that, okay? <laughs> You're never gonna see that. So I will fuse that together. I do want it fused, um, because if I have to wash this, I don't want the back of this opening up, so I fuse that. And now I can go in and stitch it, and if I lift up these petals, I honestly 
cannot even see where I fuse that together. And then I just stitch it on with a triple stitch, a straight stitch, a double stitch, whatever you happen, like a fancy stitch, whatever you want to put on there. And then that does a really nice job in making perfect petals that you don't have to spend a whole lot of time doing. And then the other project I did from the book is this table runner right here. Um, now this was really um, a fun project to do and um, I actually uh, um, quilted it on the cutie frame, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, but um, this is paper pieced. I am not a paper piecing fan. I know a lot of you out there are, but I am not. I did paper piece this. Paper piecing is supposed to give you perfect little um, everythings. Yeah, not me, okay? Because <laughs> that just doesn't fit well in my brain. Um, so I, um, you uh, piece the blocks, so you've got all the trees um, uh, strip piece, and then you offset the strips, and then you cut the trees out, and then you paper piece them into the block. Now, I made this um, probably at the end of February, um, and I had to wait to put my cutie frame together in order to um, uh, uh, quilt it. So it's been hanging, it was hanging in my studio for a couple of weeks. And then I got my cutie frame together and I quilted it, took pictures of it, sent it to Lori, sent it um, to Linda, sent it to everybody that needed pictures of it. And then I was reviewing my pictures and I went, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. I stared at this quilt for a month before I even saw that I had this block upside down. And um, some people go, oh my gosh, um, are you gonna fix that? I went, heck no, this is me. This is so me, <laughs> I'm just leaving it. So I called Lori and I said, Lori, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. I have this tree upside down. I said, let me send you a new picture in about an hour. So an hour later, I sent her a new picture and she calls me, she goes, did you take all that all apart and fix it? Heck no, I photoshopped it. So <laughs> when you see any pictures of it, that's Photoshop. This is the real me. This is really what I did, okay? So I'm just gonna leave that there. Um, I did put on the um, piano keys like border around the outside that is not in the pattern, but I had so much left over of this fabric. I guess I was in a cutting spree this time. I just cut so much. So I put, um, put uh, that around the border as well. So it, it was super fun to do, even though I did make this huge mistake down here. <laughs> Okay, I will show you my Let Heaven and Nature Sing banner. I did mine the old fashioned way. I hand embroidered everything that needed hand embroidering. I cut my pieces out with stencils and <clears throat> sat and stitched them on. I found these cute little snowflake buttons that I put on here and a little teeny red one that I found in a package at Joann's. I have an enclosed entry and I decided to make mine into a flag hanging because I can put it out on the porch and the weather won't affect it. So that's my heaven and nature sing hang, oh, flag hanging. And then In the book, they show the little gnome ornaments. I made these with felt rather than the wool and <clears throat> used pearl cotton around them. And they also have those cute little buttons. And I used a waxed string for my hangers. It says to stuff them with um, fiber fill and um, I had all these scraps left from my felt, and I thought, well, there's no sense in throwing that away, so I snipped it all up and stuffed it inside. So that's what they're stuffed with. I didn't waste that. I also thought it would be cute to do them on a couple of napkins. I did machine applique as well as hand embroidery and pearl cotton embroidery. And again, use those cute little buttons. And I thought this would also be really cute in a table runner, putting one of each on the end of each table runner. So that's my gnome presentation. And I 
I also did the placemats, the wreath and snow globe placemat. And the wreath pattern actually is supposed to be this orientation. Mine turned out backwards, but that's for a left-handed person. The other one was the snow globe placemat. And <clears throat> I also used the little snowflakes inside. And I used the um, Biani vinyl and I applied it to the outside after I got done. Just stitched it right around the edges and it, it goes on perfectly. I did not remember to decorate my Christmas tree, but I think maybe all those dots just kind of threw me. So that's the snow globe and the wreath placemats. Okay. Um, the next pattern is Spring Meadow, and um, I'm going to do that, um, I show you how to use the Design Pro uh, applique mat. This is such a great mat for working with your projects for appliques, or anytime you have anything that you're going to press that might be a little bit sticky, or that you need to fuse together and want to protect your ironing surface. Okay. So uh, this one is the um, Spring Meadow. And you can see there's lots of flowers on there. Now, I was going to order the kit. Um, it wasn't a kit by the, the person that made the design, so it was different fabrics. And a lot of the fabrics in the kit was a, a little bit dark. And on my black background, probably wouldn't have shown up very well, so I would have had to recut some of the um, uh, fabrics. So I decided just to cut them all myself. So um, there is an SVG file that you can download um, from her website. Uh, for the, all the patterns. Now what I like about, most about the patterns is on the back, she shows you exactly which fabric goes in what place. She labels it fabric one, fabric two, fabric three, and just say, instead of just saying, grab the uh, light yellow fabric, she shows you a picture of it so it's very clear which, where each fabric goes. Now I do like to play around with designs and do my own thing. However, this was so beautiful the way it was, I didn't want to make um, any changes on the layout because I just thought it was perfect. So I put fusible web on the back of all my fabrics, fuse them, and then cut them out with my scan and cut. Now I have this big wreath that I have to place all the flowers for. And so I took the pattern and I placed it underneath the Design Pro mat. And as you can see, you can see through the Design Pro mat. So I could see my pattern underneath here. So I'm gonna lay that pattern underneath here and then set my flowers that have fusible web on them. And I'm gonna do just a section at a time because you can see they overlap, so they'll fuse together. And so I'll fuse together just sections at a time by just laying this on all the different pattern pieces. When it's all done, then I um, had to put this on my light box because of the black background, and this black background is sewn, black um, strip, silver strip, black strip, silver strip, so I didn't buy the fabric that way, that was pieced that way, and that is part of the pattern. And then I laid it on my light box so I could see through the dark fabric and placed all of these design um, uh, fabric uh, cuttings on there, just like she did in her pattern. And then I decided that I would add crystals and buttons. The buttons, I think, are great in centers of fabric, but I don't always like the thread showing. So I put, I um, uh, can't remember the size. I want to say they are, um, SS30. These are SS30s, the great big ones in here, and the little ones are 16 SS, the little tiny ones all over the place. And those are fused down one at a time, and I put the big ones on top of the thread so you didn't see the thread. And then there are 138 of the little blue crystals and 35 of the big crystals, and I just love the way that turned out. I love applique, so um, doing the applique around the outer edge was just super fun for me. I do like to use the grass stitch, um, which is a uh, stitch that's either uneven on both sides or straight on one side and uneven on the other. I think that adds a lot to flowers when you use that for your applique. So that was just great fun to make, and um, it was beautiful just the way it was. And everything um, on there, uh, all those were fabric scraps that I had. There, I didn't go out and buy any fabric. I had plenty of fabric to do all that, and it just turned out just exactly the way I wanted. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is um, our design that we brought in. This is the OESD floral quilting design. It's just beautiful. 
See on the back, there's quite a few designs. Now, one must learn to read because sometimes I think I know more than I really do. And so as I was doing this design, I thought, oh, I'll just take the first one and do it, put it on um, 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 my machine. There is a USB stick in here. It is not a CD, so there's a USB stick. You can put it right in your machine. And I just pulled off the first one. Well, unbeknownst to me, I was, as I was stitching out, I thought, oh, you know, I should stitch over that a second time. Well, it's in here twice, once as a single run and once as a triple run. I should have read the directions before I actually started. And it actually said that right here on the front cover. I should have seen that. However, this is what I made. There we go. And even though I should have used a triple run, Tri triple run, that is very hard to say. Triple run, I think um, it still turned out fine. The um, uh, table runner is actually an OESD table runner. Um, it's already pre-hemmed and ready to go. There is um, a white, or excuse me, that's black actually, and an oatmeal color, and uh, they turned out just beautiful. And I did use a, the camera on a 10 needle to get that um, all around and get the corners perfect. Loved how that turned out. Also, what I made from the OESD design several things here. Um, one of the things that I like to do is I like to step out of um, uh, my sewing machine box or my coloring box or anything. I like to do a, a bunch of different things. So I decided that I was going to stitch some of these designs on watercolor paper, okay? So, oops, I'm caught, I'm caught. That's not supposed to happen on filming, right? <laughs> okay, so I decided to stitch these on watercolor paper and um, mixed media paper. This is mixed media paper, black mixed media paper. It's 184 pounds, so it's pretty hefty, okay? And then I also used 184 pound watercolor paper, okay? This is cold press watercolor paper. There's also hot press, either one will work. The difference is um, hot press is very, very smooth on both sides and cold press is pretty smooth on one side, a little textured on the other. Cold press is what you'll usually find around in the hobby shops around here, okay? So the first one I wanna show you um, design is this one. This one was um, stitched on the 184 pound black paper, and that is colored with watercolor pencils, no water, just strictly colored on there. And I love the dull kind of antique vintage look that that gives. Um, and that is just one stitch around. And I think that turned out pretty cool. Love how that looked. And no stabilizer, okay? 184 pound doesn't need stabilizer. However, it depends on the hoop you're using. If you're using a standard hoop with your machine, the only way to make this work is to put a uh, stabilizer in there and then tape your paper down to the, um, the stabilizer. That's fine, it will work good, um, but don't use a very aggressive tape. Um, even the pink um, Floriani tape is a little too aggressive, it can pull the thing off. So a very a tape with a l very little tack is needed to hold it down. If you're using a magnetic hoop, like the dime magnetic hoop, that works great because I could just take the whole piece of paper and just slap it right in there and slap the um, top on because the dime is flat and the top fits on there flat and the pa paper just sits right in there. I didn't need to put in any stabilizer. So I love the way that one looked. Now this is the one I did that used the triple stitch. You can see that the triple stitch just makes it pops. It almost looks like cloisonne. And again, I colored that with watercolor pencils and no water. Just loved how that looks. And you can see here's the difference between the triple run and the single run. Okay, just fabulous. And neither one of them had stabilizer, okay. Now, the next thing I did is, um, a lot of you out there know me and know that I like to stitch on wood. And so I decided to do a wood one. And um, this is 16th inch balsa wood. I will be having a class later this year on how to, um, a virtual class on how to stitch on balsa wood. And um, I, do, I did have to, you do have to mount this onto something. And I did mount it on a fiberboard so you can see it's a little curved. 
Um, but for some reason, they won't let me use saws in my apartment to cut wood. I just don't get that. And my saws are over at my son-in-law's place, um, and I, I didn't have time to run over there to cut. I usually use a thin wood backing, um, but um, the foam core is all I had, so that's why it's bent a little bit. But what I want to point out is when I colored this with pencils, in my watercolor class, um, when you, uh, or my colored pencil class, when you color like in a color book or something, you keep your pencils very sharp. But when you're coloring on something like this, you're going to dull that point because a sharp pencil will just destroy the, um, the balsa wood. And so you want it um, very uh, flat on the edge. And you just lightly color. And then I did add water to that to spread it out a little bit and give it the, the look. And then you notice the dragonflies and the corners. Those are from the scrapbooking section. Um, and those little dragonflies are brads. And then the little corners on there are from, <laughs> I bought this at a scrapbook store. Uh, probably 20 years ago, and found it in the back of the corner of my um, drawer just the other day. And I went, oh my gosh, I think we'll use those. So that turned out really well um, to do that. And um, this is a card that I made with the white cardstock. And when I stitch out a card, I always stitch in the middle, okay? And no stabilizer. I stitch in the middle because then when I score the sides, I can put that over and I tape it in place. And now you can't see the, um, the bobbin uh, thread or any stabilizer or anything. Um, and you can write your message on there. And I always use double-sided tape versus glue. I like the double-sided tape way better. And then I take one of the uh, little brayer or the little clover roll and press, and I really press that down hard so I can seal it. But that makes a really nice card and no nobody can see um, anything. And then I did use watercolor pencil on the front and a little bit of water to spread that out. Okay, and um, then I did this one, and this one is done on fabric. Now, I will be having a, um, a Starts Tuesday, uh, a series of five classes on how to color on fabric, and the first one is done with colored pencils, which is this one right here. It's done with colored pencils. The second class will be Sukuneko inks, and each class will be different, um, and it's a series of five classes, but the first one is how to do it on fabric, and if you can see this, I did this on tone-on-tone -tone fabric. And when you do it on tone on tone fabric, the tone in the print picks up the color differently and gives you a unique look. You can see the swirls in there um, from coloring it on the, um, the tone on tone fabric. Um, this was done with the uh, watercolor pencils and then a fabric medium was uh, applied to it to make it permanent on, onto the uh, fabric. Uh, the little crystals were sewn on with a zigzag stitch around the outer edge um, to finish it off and tack down the binding. So really pleased with a lot of the designs in that um, design pack. And I think, make sure I found them all. <laughs> okay, so I think that's all I have. Linda will show you hers. All right. I have not done any watercolor technique with fabric until I started this. I didn't know exactly what I was doing other than what I'd done with the kids when they were little, when they had little watercolor trays and a big glass of water and a brush with water everywhere. So this one turned out a little more like a watercolor. What I did for this particular design, I went online and found a picture that I liked that I thought would work with this application because I thought, I can stitch out those lines and then color around it. When I transferred the design from my picture, I used a friction pen and I just drew, hand drew the design on the bag. And I drew a little friction line there just so you can see. Now, after I stitched it out, I ironed that friction off. And so it goes away and it doesn't stay. And of course, I washed this before I started and I opened up the seam so it was flat, so it was easier to, to use. And then I thought I wanted a little more controlled look. So I did the same process on this tea towel. I, I drew the pattern freehand, then I stitched it on with corresponding colors, ironed off the friction to make sure it wasn't going to interfere with my design, 
and then I use the water watercolor pencils with the fabric medium to set the color. You also can use, according to teachers online, you can use an iron to set the color, or you can put it in a dryer and heat set it. And so I didn't want to take any chances, so I did all three. And then I, in my Solaris, I found this cute rooster design that I think is originally supposed to be a patch, but I was able to blow it up 400%, and I thought, I can watercolor that design in. So that's what I did, and then I stitched around in circles around the pad with my Sashiko machine, and then used a corresponding bias, fabric bias tape. And it makes a really cute little trivet. The other project that I did was I found this design in my Solaris. It's just a plain stitch out. And then I did it on another one and proceeded to use the watercolors on this as well. And then brought the back to the front, mitered the corners, and I have a cute little placemat. It's got a layer of SF-101 inside of it for stabilizer that I applied after I stitched it out, but just so that it would uh, stiffen up the placemat. And... Okay. Then as long as we're talking about the OESD table runners, I did mine in the beige color. Again, it's all self-finished, ready to stitch. I used the central motif from our OESD pattern that Lana showed you. And when I went home and I put it in the machine, I was looking through the patterns, of which there are 25 different designs. Lana's used the corner design and the extension on her black table runner. I used, well, there's two of them here, two small and then the center motif. When I put it on the machine and looked for that central motif, I couldn't find it in my brother 5200. So I came back to the store and I said, I think there's something wrong with this. And she said, what machine are you using? And I told her, she said, well, it's not big enough. And I said, well, what am I gonna do? She says, well, she showed me the Luminaire and she showed me the um, Solaris and I said, what am I going to do now? And she just kind of did one of these. And I said, well, I guess I won't get a new car. I'll get a Solaris. So I was able to do that central motif because it is a nine inch design. I also did it on my quilt. Here's the central motif that I had to have. And I used 12 of the designs that are in that program. On both of these sides, I use one design, use the mirror key, and flip the design. On the bottom here, I use one design and again flipped it to mirror it. I did this in the triple stitch in a King Tut variegated. And then I use King Tut pale blue to do my diagonal quilting. I cloud stitched around each one of these designs so that I had a demarcation for stopping my diagonal quilting. And it's a white on white fabric. I thought it was real pretty and possibly would make a very nice bridal quilt. And then as long as we're talking about the OESD designs and the watercolors, I stitched all of my designs out first so that I could see exactly how large they were and where my placement would be. So this was just some scrap fabric that I stitched one of the designs on. And when I was ready to do the watercolor, I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll color that out 
and I stitched, I ended up finishing it out in a mug rug. This is the first mug rug I've ever done. But it turned out cute, and it gave me an idea of how to proceed with those pencils. Okay, so um, one of the products we brought in is called Fray Away for quilting and embroidery. So if you accidentally clip your fabric or um, the thread knot isn't holding or something, uh, this is a little more aggressive than um, uh, some of the softer ones. It's a little bit harder, but sometimes we need a little firmer um, uh, uh, fray check-like project uh, product. And uh, this does prevent the fraying. It secures the thread ends, and it has an ultra-fine tip on it. So this is great if you're looking for something that has a little more oomph to the, the fray check. And you want to talk about these, Linda? Sure. All right, the other pro uh, item that we wanted to show you is the Soline colored pencil. And this one is three colors in one. It's white, pink, and blue. It's erasable, and the eraser is on the top of the pencil. And you twist it to put the color out, twist it again to get the next color, and the next. And this works perfect with these Mylar stencils that we brought in. This one's called Primrose. And these pencils are, work perfect right inside of those cutouts. And they lay down. I did mine on this pre-made tea towel and you can see that you can work the design all the way around in this case on a tea towel or you could do it on a tablecloth or a quilt we also have the mod dots stencil same principle, and I used mine on this pre-made tea towel. Just went across the end. And I'm new to free motion, as you will soon find out. And some of my circles turned into elbows. But with practice, I'm sure I will get better at that. So that's our, our Soline stencil, or um, marker pencil, and the uh, Mylar stencils. All right, so we did bring in the, the, those cute Mylar stencils as um, Linda was telling you, they're adorable. Uh, we also brought in um, this one, it is called uh, Flurry of Feathers. And this one you can't use the markers with because this is kind of a, a screen, if you will, in here. Um, and those won't fit, so you will have to use a pouncer. And you can also use a pouncer on these. And the pouncer that we brought in was the Ultimate Pouncer Powder, and that powder um, irons away. And um, it works great, and I'll give you some more information about that in a little bit, um, uh, as far as it going away. Um, one of the things I've heard about the quilt pouncer is that it doesn't work. And the problem is, is you actually really need to read the directions, okay? The directions tell you what to do. So obviously the first thing is we can figure out you remove that, that plug. Then you're gonna take and put your powder in there and plug it back up. Now there is a, like a net or a, a netting like thing in there and you have to pounce this 50 times to get it below that net and down to the sponge at the bottom, okay? Now you will get a bunch of um, powder in here, just pour it back in the bag or into here. Once you pounce it 50 times, then all you're gonna do is set your stencil down on your fabric, whether it's the, um, the flurry of feathers type or the mylar type, and all you're going to do is swipe. So here's one, and I usually tape this down so it doesn't move, and you can see how perfect that print is with just a couple of swipes, no pouncing. The only pouncing is to get it down to the sponge area, okay? And, um, uh, one of the things was uh, um, about ironing it away, okay? And I'm gonna give you a tip a little bit later about, um, about the powder, but it does iron away. I took and I ironed it away, and I put it in the freezer for a couple hours on my sample. Um, because we know that the friction pen comes back in cold. So I marked it up with friction pen, marked it up with a, um, uh, uh, this. I also put this powder that comes with this in my chalker. 
I empty out all the contents in the chalker and I put this powder in here. So now I have a line chalker that has the powder that irons away. So I did a couple lines of that through that, um, ironed it all the way through it in the freezer. The only thing that came back was the friction pens. The powder did not come back. So it just works really, really great for that. I really like this powder and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, so now um, we're gonna do um, 25 days to better quilting and Linda's gonna start us off with that and her great samples. Sometimes Lana has a tendency to exaggerate when she <laughs> says things like great samples. I am not a free motion quilter. I think that perhaps this month our boss decided since I wasn't, she was going to drag me kicking and screaming into the free motion world. And thus we got this great book by Lori Kennedy. Now, I have to say, Lori has been doing this for at least 25 years, so she is an expert. I started by making my sandwiches, which she suggests getting backing fabric, batting, and front fabric. I used an old sheet for these because I didn't want to use that expensive fabric on my samples. I'm probably the only one that's going to see these other than you, the whole world. And then on the front, I used fat quarters from the local fabric store when they go on sale. And I've got it upside down. So it says 25 days to better free motion quilting. I won't show you my first day. That's something nobody's ever going to see. But it did get better as this was day two. And I wrote it up top here so that I'd remember. I also wrote my name. And unlike Lana, who was blessed with a name without an I, I have an I in my name. So I little, squiggled a little bit of thread up at the top to dot that I. And it did get a little bit better. And as I say, practice, they say practice makes perfect. I don't think it makes perfect, it makes better. And this was about day five, and I think I did get better because my stars, I was able to work those out. And I actually did the little flower down here like Lori has done in her book. So that was actually March 15th, didn't bother to dot that I, but that's what it looks like when you're a newbie. And now Lana's going to show you what a professional can do. Oh, professional by no way. However, I have been doing it for a while. I'm really good at stippling and um, thread painting. I love thread painting. Um, but when I try to do like a perfect feather, I would get like the first um, feather done well, the second feather would be done well. By the time I got to the third and fourth feather, it looked like my bird died. I couldn't keep it consistent. And so that's where I always struggled. And that's why I like the rulers. Um, the rulers always gave me confidence. But I really wanted to get better with quilting, um, free motion um, uh, designs like the feathers and stuff like that without having to uh, always grab something. Um, so I was really tickled when Lori came out with this book because I followed her for a while and I love her quilting style. She is just amazing at some of the things that she does in here. And she gives out a few tips. Now I've been de-stashing my place and I just gave away hundreds of my books, literally hundreds. I think if I, I kind of guessed the, the stacks of them and this is a 30 year collection. There was over 700 books I gave to a Spokane library um, so that they can uh, sell it and earn some money for there because I wasn't using them. I would use the book and put it in my closet and never look at it again. So I thought it's time for someone to, to get that stash. Um, but this book is one that I will keep because there's some great um, tips and stuff in here that Lori tells you so that you can be better at free motion. And if you notice Linda's, she got better and better all along the way. That's why I said hers were so great because if she never started, um, she wouldn't be as good as she is now. So if you free motion today and you're awful, which you probably would be, and you don't do anything for six months, you're still awful because you haven't practiced, okay? So what you need to do like Linda did is put your, um, the date on there as to when you did the free motion, and I would put the year as well, um, and then stash it aside and don't look at it. 
and then keep doing that for several months and then go back and look at your first one. You'll be surprised how far you come because it does take practice. Now, one of the things that Lori says in her book is to draw some lines and then practice um, the, the designs that she tells you to and make sure you hit the line so you stay consistent. And you can see I've been practicing and practicing and practicing along the way, okay? And again, do this little quilt sandwiches. And then she has you draw um, lines um, in squares to kind of contain you into areas. And you probably can't see this online, uh, or, but I can still see my lines on here from chalkers, but this has been in my bins and in Linda's bins and in and out of bins and stuff. And the lines are starting to fade a little bit now after a month. But um, one of the things I read online, because I'm not a quilter and I'm not a long armor, I'm an embroiderer. So when I quilt, it's just really because I like to and it's fun and it's something different than embroidery. Um, but I don't know all the tips and tricks and stuff like some of you all do who have been doing nothing but quilting and long arming your, your beautiful quilts. Um, when I chalk this with my chalker, like I said, I put the ultimate powder in a chalker. I dump out all the contents and put the ultimate powder in a chalker. And then I line this. On the, um, some tip that I got online, it said to spray the, um, the uh, chalk, whether it's the ultimate powder or regular chalk, with um, a, a sizing to help keep it on your quilt while you're doing your quilting, because you know chalk will just disappear when you wipe it off. And it actually worked really, really well. And so I sprayed it with sizing, let it dry, and I used just Best Press, because that's all I had at the moment, um, and let it dry. And then I did all my designs. Then when uh, my sample piece, I ironed it off, and I put that in the freezer to see if once you put the Best Press on, will it, um, uh, uh, still come off and it did but you know in some of the little areas sometimes the chalk likes to stay there and the iron doesn't get in there so what I do actually is I do spray it with a little bit of best press and then I take a toothbrush and you don't use your toothbrush use a family member's toothbrush and brush that um, that chalk out of there okay so this is to continue and then I did my name across here a couple of times um, and then she talks a lot about um, uh, thread weights and all that. So on the sample here, and I'm not sure you can get a really good picture of this, I did quite a few thread weights. So this first one is 80 weight quilter select thread. And I also put on here the bobbin weight I used and the needle that I used. And then this one over here is Arafil 50 slash two. And again, I put the uh, weight and the needle that I used. And down here at the bottom, this is a 40 slash three YLI. Down here at the bottom, this would be comparable to a King Tut thread. And then this one, this one is a 24 slash three wild eye. This is a really heavy thread and it's stitched beautifully, but my thread color cutters did not like it at all. So I didn't use any thread cutters on that. And then in the middle, I use monofilament thread and each one uh, shows the, uh, the thread weight, the thread needle and the bobbin that I use for each one so I could get balanced weight um, while I was quilting. And so she talks a lot about um, all those things and different battings and all that stuff. I just a wealth of information in there. Another thing she says to do is do messy posies. And I love the messy posies because it really gives you a chance just to play around and try to get the feel of your machine to get your um, speed even and your movement even and all that. And it, it isn't that you should be fast. Your machine, you, your machine should be running faster than you are moving, but you don't have to go top speed. You need to go the speed that's comfortable for you and your machine. And messy posies is really a great one just to go around and round in circles and um, get used to your machine. Now, one of the things that I do, um, uh, you you guys that are local know we have the big show, the um, Puyallup show and the quilt show and stuff like that. And we always have the Westerly people come and they do demos in our booth. Well, when they're done, they take all their samples and just kind of toss them away because they don't need them. They do hundreds of them. I go collect all those because then I take them home and then I throw another piece of fabric over the top and I reuse that quilt sandwich over and over again. So then when I'm done with, um, with using a quilt sandwich, then I throw another, you can see quite a bit of quilting on there for that they have done. Then I throw another piece of fabric on the other side and quilt it again. I might put two or three pieces on either side so it's so thick it can't go into my machine anymore. And then I'll start using the corners to sample test stitches and stuff. So, don't, you don't have to have a fresh sample every single time if you're just playing around. Just throw another piece of fabric over the top. Save yourself some batting. This one also shows that um, uh, the, the two different um, stencils that we brought in, and it shows uh, that I used the, uh, the ultimate powder, and I sprayed it with um, sizing, the best press, and that's still on there really well. And again, it's been in and out of bins, and uh, obviously I didn't do a whole lot of stitching like the first sample, but that's still on there, and that will iron away, and it will look really great when it's um, all ironed away. 
Now, I want to show you a couple of my favorite, favorite chips from the book. And um, let me do this one first. OK, so one of the things um, I struggle with is knowing what to put on the quilt. What should I put on the quilt? It's a good, I've ripped out so much quilting because it looked awful. I didn't, um, I didn't like it, and I ripped it out, and I wound up to go back to stippling because I didn't know what else to do because I, could, I didn't know. OK, so one of the things she said in the book is, again, we're going to use the, the, the vinyl. And I love this vinyl because it's 16 gauge, so it has some nice weight to it. And you're going to go just go down to the um, uh, stationery store and just buy a dry erase markers. OK, I got the kind with the little um, eraser on the end. So what you're going to do is you'll take your vinyl and cut a piece of it, whatever size you need, the size makes no difference, and either um, put binding around the edge or just tape it like I did. And the reason for that is you don't want to draw off of this onto your quilt and the, the binding or the tape will stop you. Then what you'll do is you'll take your vinyl and you'll put it on your quilt. Now obviously you want to do this on a table, not up in the air, but you'll put it wherever you want to um, audition your design and then you will just draw your design on there and go, oh, you know what, that might be good, but I want to see what this is going to look like. So you will erase that. So I just took my marker and erased it. And then I'll put up there, and then I'll try a different design and see if I like that better. And I get to audition each and every one of the designs before I actually stitch them out. So I thought that was an excellent tip. Now, the other thing I want to show you about free motion is um, free motion isn't always done on quilts. And quilting tools aren't always used for quilts, OK? So um, on this design right here, this is a card. And um, I use the stencil on there. And I'm going to show you in a minute how I stitched that. Because if you make a mistake on this 184-pound card and you stitch a stitch out of whack, that hole never goes away. So I'm going to show you how I do that so that it always looks perfect. And again, I stitched in the middle so I could bring the side over and tape it down. Then you just write your message on the side. So this is not a quilt, but I used stencil and um, ultimate powder and quilting tools to make my card. This also is not a quilt, but again, I'm using quilting tools. I'm using the um, a flurry of feathers uh, um, stencil, and I stenciled this faux leather. And again, I'm going to show you how I stitch that, because sometimes when you want to do a project like this and your free motion isn't where you want it to be yet, I have a tip for you on how to make that work. So I just did a quick little... Um, purse on here in this faux leather to make that. So let me go over to the um, machine over here. I have to think what machine I'm on. Okay. So you can see here, I've done a couple samples on here. And you want an open toe foot. I would even get one without this plastic here. You want it up very clear and open so you can see the path. Um, and uh, uh, this little plastic can be a little bit distorting, but for what I'm doing, it's going to be fine. Okay. And you can see that I have drawn out one of the stencils here with um, the blue part of the marker on the sew line trio. And what I will do, um, instead of free motion stitching, I am going, and I'll just start, start right here um, on this part of the design. I'd obviously start at the beginning, but um, we're just going to show you a little bit of this. Let me get that in the right spot, okay? And um, I'm going to work with needle down on this. And basically what I'm going to do, instead of taking and just trying to free motion around this and getting this perfect and uh, um, hope to gosh that I don't make a mistake, I am going to walk my way around all of this. When Before I knew what free motion was, I didn't even know that that was a term. This is how I did all what I called, what, what's called today free motion. This is how I did it. I just took and I walked my way around and make sure I stitched in the line, okay? Um, you, uh, let's see. Okay, let me see if I got that set right. Oh, nope. I want... Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pretend. This should, you should set up your machine for so that the foot lifts up a little bit. And um, I'm, I don't use a brother that often, so I have to kind of fake it here. Um, and you're just going to walk your way around the design 
and get your perfect stitching on your uh, full leather, on your even on your quilt. And you can see here that I hit the line just right all the way around, and it's going to take you longer, but it's better to take you a little bit longer to do this than to have to start this three or four times, okay? It's much easier to do it that way, all right? And the last thing we have today, oh, one more thing I want to show you over here. Oh, I almost forgot. Let's go back to the machine. Had to look at my nose. Pretend I have a free motion foot on here, and um, we'll just go on this side. Okay, so pretend I have a free motion foot on here. And what, what she said to do, actually that has too many threads, we'll do this. Um, what she said to do is, um, for years when I was free motion stitching, I always put my hands like this because I thought I had to have a death grip on the fabric to, to, to move it. And I found that I really struggled trying to get around everything um, doing my job. In her book, and this probably, this was a game changer for me, that's why I just think this book is so fabulous. Um, how she says to put your hands when you're free motioning on a machine like this is don't grab it like this. You have really no control. You're gonna put your hands like this in the shape of a heart, okay? Obviously, if I had a table out here, I could put my hands a little bit further apart, but you're gonna put your hands in the uh, shape of a heart, and then you're gonna move and do your design. When you reach the part where you can't go anymore, you'll move your hands again in the shape of a heart, and you'll do your free motion. I was amazed at how much more control I had over my quilt by doing it this way versus this way. It made a huge, huge difference. And like I said, it was a game changer for me because I had way more control of my quilt doing it like this. So, so definitely one of the best tips in the book, okay? So now the last thing I believe, is that right, Linda? I think this last thing um, we have is the cutie frame. Okay, and that is over here. And I'm not going to show you how it goes together, comes apart, or anything like that. Reva has some excellent videos online on how this whole thing works. Uh, you want to look them up because she did a great job in showing you how to put this thing um, uh, to use. What I want to tell you is just my little adventure with it. Um, because um, I live in a small place now. I downsized from a larger place to a very small place. And um, I wanted a quilt frame. And this popped up on Facebook on an ad. And I went, <gasps> That's my answer. I want this. Um, so um, I went and, and looked at this and I went, oh my God, this is perfect. It'll just be perfect. So I put it together in three and a half hours by myself. Okay. It was the instructions were easy. Um, I had no problems putting it together. And um, it's sitting on top of my cutting table. Okay. And I'm using my Foff icon on it. Now, if you've seen the Foff icon, my, the performance icon, not the embroidery one, but the embroidery one, pretty much the same. Um, that thing is a beast. It is huge. And it fit on here. And boy, it was so smooth across here. Um, this part right here, I'm not going to take this off, but this bar under here, you loosen this up and this whole bar comes out. So I have more spot because I have a bigger throat on the icon, so I can move this out for more space. So that was like huge for me. I was really excited about that. Um, but the one thing um, I'm not excited about is wasting fabric, um, and I didn't have any leaders because I just got this, and they said, I had like six or eight inches on this side, 12 inches on that side, so you have um, amount to put around the bars, which makes sense, but I didn't want to do that. So I went to the back because I just got this and I wanted to use it and I didn't have any leader. So I just got a bolt of canvas out of my back room and I cut some strips and um, it said to, and I'm trying to follow the directions because I know nothing about long arming and quilting. So I'm trying to follow the directions and it says to pin it to your leader. I hate pinning. I don't like it at all. And so I pinned it there and I pinned everything and I went, oh, this is awful. And I really didn't like it because I didn't think it held the quilt firm enough to the leaders that I put. So um, on the second quilt I did, I went, you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to go get my book binding stapler. So I went and got my big long stapler and I stapled my quilt to the canvas. So I stapled the batting and the backing to my leader that I made. And then I stapled the quilt to the batting and backing along the seam allowance. Oh my gosh, 
That worked so well, I just went staple, 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 threw it on here, and it held it so firm. It gave it nice tension because I could put more staples in than I was willing to put pins in, and that was just absolutely great. And um, when I took it out, I instead of using one of those claw um, staple removers, I used one of the scoopy ones to scoop that thing right out. And that was perfect. There was no damage to the fabric or anything. And I think, honestly, that's the way I'm going to do it from now on because I really like the stapler. And um, so this was great. Um, when I took it apart, it took me about a half an hour because the main pieces will stay together. And I put it in my closet. So when I need it again, it'll take me probably about a half an hour to put it back together again, throw it on my table, and I'm ready to quilt again. So people with small areas like I have, um, this, this is the answer. And I can do any size quilt I want on here. I mainly do the size you see up here on our wall, but I could do a larger quilt. I just need to move it along um, from spot. You can see we have extra fabric, so this could honestly be a much larger quilt on here, and I could do any size quilt. So this was the answer for me with a small space, and I didn't have to buy another machine. I could use the machine I already had um, because there's little latches back here that move in and tighten um, for any size um, uh, machine that you have. So this was like the best, and this moves across her so smoothly. I was like in love with this that when I tested it, I made them put an icon on it at the store so I could make sure that's what I wanted. And um, you might not have that option because there might not be your machine in there, but um, since mine is a newer machine, they had it, and it was like, oh my gosh, I love this. This is like perfect. So I love this frame. If you're thinking about something like this, um, go down to the store, take a look at it. Uh, they would love to show it to you. It is an awesome, awesome uh, frame, especially for those of us with very small little areas to the, and you still want a quilt frame. So love, love, love this. It's awesome. All right. Are we done? I think that's it. I think we're done. So thank you so much for joining us today. I hope um, that uh, you picked up a few tips and tricks from us and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye.